everybody. Welcome to a, a slightly different um, session today. We are going to be looking at careers in investment management specifically with two of the sponsors of one of our programmes. Um, so I'd like to welcome Rhys Simons, who's a, a senior investment associate at Willis Towers Watson. And uh, we've also got Gillian Chavinge, who's uh, an equity research analyst at Aberdeen Standard Investments and co-founder at Breaking Through Careers. Welcome, Rhys and, and Gillian. How are you both? Good, thanks, Matt. How are you doing? Good, yeah, not too bad, thanks. How about yourself, Gillian? Wonderful, thank you. Great, thanks. Good, fantastic. Thank you both for, for joining us. So, Rhys and Gillian, we, we're going to talk a bit about um, careers because you, you both work in investment management um, and uh, we thought it would be nice to share a bit more about what you do, give a bit more insight to the students that, that study towards our qualifications and these programmes to understand a bit more about what investment management is all about, the different roles and how people can look to access those. So um, if we can start with you, Rhys, if you can just tell us a bit about Willis Towers Watson um, uh, and who you work for, first of all, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, sure. So Willis Towers Watson is predominantly an uh, investment broking business, um, but I'm, I'm in the Towers Watson part of Willis Towers Watson, which is basically an investment firm. So it's an investment consulting uh, company, which basically provide investment advice and delegated investment uh, solutions to large asset owners, uh, which predominantly are um, kind of pension schemes. Okay, great. Thanks, Reese. And um, over to you, Gillian. Um, tell us a bit about Aberdeen Standard Investments. Also, we have your role as a co-founder at Breaking Through Careers. So can you tell us a little, little bit about what Breaking Through Careers is all about as well, please? Yes, of course. So Aberdeen Standard Investments, or Aberdeen as we will be in a couple of weeks, is a, an investment manager and we invest right across the board so across uh, those asset classes and these could be fixed income which is debt real estate so property equities which is public companies infrastructure and so on so on and we do that on behalf of clients they could be um high net worth individuals individuals they could be um pension funds for example insurance companies so a whole range of clients and um, breaking through careers is a career service that aims to help young people choose and pursue careers that are right for them. So we try and do it in a way that young people actually want to engage with yeah, podcasts and comedy. And so yeah, that's what we do. Fantastic. Thank you. And I know, Gillian, you've been kind enough to send through some of the podcasts um, and bits and pieces that, that Breaking Through Careers have, 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 have put together. So I will share those also with students, which would be really useful for them to, to have a listen to as well. So thank you very much. Um, both of you for, for giving us that introduction to your firms there. So I'm just going to um, bring these slides down so we can um, see you both properly. Um, and then we will get on to asking you a few questions and hopefully having a, a bit more of a conversation um, about some of the, the things that you do day to day and, and what goes on. So um, Reese, we'll talk to you first. So the first question I've kind of got is how did you find your way into the investment management profession? So how did you get to where you are? Yeah, sure. So um, I studied finance, accounting and management at university, uh, went to Nottingham um, and I, I kind of had I, when I was back in school, I originally wanted to be a doctor and basically didn't get the predicted grades to be able to get into medicine, which was a good thing because, you know, I definitely wasn't the path, you know, 10 years of really hard work probably wasn't the path that I uh, wanted to go down. So it was always either science or maths. So I ended up going the maths route and having a touch of accounting at university helped me realize that wasn't the career path for me um, but I wanted to do a professional qualification and CFA seemed like another good one to do the investment industry was something that was I guess quite opaque to me at the time um, but seemed quite interesting speaking to some people at kind of career days at Nottingham that kind of work in the industry and uh, that kind of helped I guess get a bit more insight into what it is that people do um and applied for grad jobs which where cfa was kind of part of that program um and willis towers watson offered me a job and i thought look at with both hands and said yes um and i guess i've been here you know it's kind of the first job i had at university i've been here nearly four years now fantastic uh, brilliant and would you say um talk about you obviously spent four years straight from uni in, in, in that role. It's quite a long time actually to spend kind of in a first role, I guess. Is there 
something that um, the culture of the firm is there something about the firm that you know you want to stay there you enjoy working there is it what attracts you to to stay at the firm so I think you know you don't want to be overly preachy I think everyone that works at a business <laughs> loves the the culture and everything there and I, I do think we do have a really good culture Willis Towers Watson that has you know the people there and the atmosphere um, definitely has been part of why I've stayed there but also I'd say you know there's obviously pros and cons of going for working for big businesses and small businesses but I personally have been given or been able to have quite a lot of freedom to change my role um, and kind of do different things I think that you know if you look at people that are seasoned professionals 30 years into their career I think it's quite rare that you find someone that's doing exactly the same job that they did when they came out of university and I think that's like a big thing you know when you first are trying to figure out what job to do you know it's not trying to put too much pressure on something you're going to be doing forever you just kind of need to make a start somewhere figure out if something you want to do and if it isn't then you move on to do something else um so I've been, I've been lucky in that you know the, the company's kind of given me the space to be able to spend you know shit to tilt my role towards the kind of areas that um i'm more interested in and you were talking about um the kind of focus on research um and that kind of thing there so you said about you were looking to become a doctor um you changed changed your mind um, do you find that there is there quite a lot of crossover in terms of some of the skills that you were using during your time studying compared to what you do now in your current role? Is there a bit of crossover there? So, so the I guess the the science aspect of my studies stopped stopped after A levels because I studied kind of a finance degree at university. Um, but I think there's there's similar kind of principles in you know enjoying learning about new things um, and learning the detail behind new things. And, you know, research is such a broad, especially kind of the way, you know, it is, our work is generally macro research and I focus on real estate and infrastructure, but we kind of need to have a good understanding of all asset classes and basically, you know, where capital should be invested at any one point in time, you know, it needs to be invested somewhere. So kind of what's the relative value between different things. And, you know, it, it, that's been the steepest learning curve is that there just is an endless amount of stuff for you to learn, uh, but that's also what makes it so interesting um, but I'd say that I'd say there's maybe some parallels between why I was interested in science, basically, you know, the, those kind of, you know, liking to learn new things and learn the detail behind new things. And I guess going into the research side of um, investment. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Rhys. Brilliant. Thank you. So, Julian, we'll come to you now. So how did you find your way to where, where you are now? So how did you your path into investment management or the investment management profession? How did that kind of come about for you? Yeah, I certainly didn't expect that when I was 16. I don't even think I knew what my job was when I was 16, but here I am. <laughs> so at A-level, I studied chemistry, history and maths at A2. And I think my favourite subject was history. But then I was in one of those situations that I think it happens a lot to young people where they're like, oh, so you do history at university, so you must either want to be a historian or a history teacher. <laughs> <laughs> like the work that you do at uni gives you two career paths. But anyways... So I then remember having conversations with my parents and um, family friends and teachers and saying, well, one day I think I'd love to maybe run my own business or work in business. And they thought, well, studying accounting and finance would be a great idea because it gives you a good understanding of companies in the working world. So I thought, great. So I did that at university. Once I got into uni, I think it came sort of second and third year when people were starting to think about what jobs they wanted to do. Everybody around me, and this happens a lot, especially when you're accounting courses, was you know, the, the idea of success in accounting is becoming an auditor of working with <laughs> That just seems to be the thing, you know, you go to your professors, they're like, ah, you could do audit or advisor for the big four. You ask your friends, oh, I'm applying for audit and advisor for the big four. <laughs> so when someone asks you, you're just like, like a robot saying audit or advisory for the big four. <laughs> and so, you know, you take that on without stopping and thinking, what do I actually want to do? What am I good at? But, you know, I was on that train and I thought, well, this is supposed to be successful. I'd like to do all right. So I got on that train and started applying and going through the millions of stages of the process. I was lucky enough to get through. But I remember there was um, Aberdeen Asset Management, as it was at the time, um, on campus. And I thought someone said, oh, you should come along. And I thought, well, you know. I don't really think this whole investments thing is really for me. I think at that time I had this preconception that it was like stuffy and then I've gone to the, the society event and it was, I was the only female, I was the only non-golf or rugby player, I was the only minority and I was like, do you know, I'm just going to go join the German society. There's like 
lots of fun there. So I did that. So in my mind, I thought I, that this isn't an industry that I'd like to necessarily go into. But I decided to go anyway because it was on my way home. And, you know, some, sometimes these events be interesting. At the very least, you'll get some free food or some free pens. And, you know, you know you're <laughs> them. these things actually happen. Um, and then when I went and they told me what it was, and I was like, whoa, what is this whole world of investments? This is actually so cool. It's so fun. It's not what I expected. Doesn't seem, you know, so stuffy. It's not all about math. It's about the world. Um, it's very future looking. And I thought, let me just give it a go. At least try for the internship. So I did, still with the intention eventually of going into audit, but then when I finally did the internship, um, I thought, okay, this is better than I'd even realized. So I did the internship and it, uh, decided to actually go down the investments route instead and apply for their equities graduate scheme. So I did that for two years. And then after that, I rolled off and became an equity research analyst. So sorry, that was like my life story, but. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's all good. So uh, did you find that at, at university, the say accounting professional bodies because it was interesting that Reese spoke about the CFA so just for people that don't know that the, the CFA is the uh, professional body or chartered financial analysts which is a bit bit of a, a little bit of a rival to the CISI actually but um, <laughs> the CFA is, is kind of this esteemed kind of holy grail isn't it of for in investment management um, and not it's not not as well known in the UK so much it's more US and um I mean, it's obviously here, but it's predominant yeah. in the USA. It's a US, I think it's a US based qualification. That's where it first started, but it's sat all over the globe today. Yeah. But yeah, it's, um, yeah. I mean, because it, so it sounds like from Gillian, it sounds like you kind of were exposed to accountancy quite a lot at university because that's one of the, the misconceptions that students, when you talk to them about finance, you know, people that, young people that are still at school, maybe in sit form, when they study business, they only ever really come across accounting. That's, that's, they're, they're never, unless you're studying economics and there's a bit about bonds thrown in there and a bit about financial regulation and things like that. There's not much about, not a huge amount about equities. You don't hear about what investment funds are. You don't hear about things like derivatives or anything like that. Um, so did you find that being at university for you, Gillian, accounting was the kind of core thing that got spoken about and nothing else really got mentioned um yes and of course more so in my accounting courses but i would definitely say if you think about the careers fairs you know the big four are very active on campuses they're great at sponsoring things they're very visible um and they're great at trying to you know, recruit young people and consider them for their um for their organizations which is which is great for them. It's wonderful to see them putting so much investment in young people. But certainly investment management, I think, is a little bit less visible. Um, in my finance courses, people did think a lot about um, investment banking as well. That was also spoken about. But again, I had all these stereotypes in my head and I was like, I wouldn't like to go into this industry. It seems cutthroat. Everyone seems like really mean. It's just orientated. And so all of these misconceptions yet again um, probably stopped me from really considering that as a, as a career. Yeah, that's, uh, and that's, um, I think, would you say that that's changed quite a lot in the time that you've you've been working um, at Aberdeen? Would you say that you've seen things very differently? Would you say that that kind of, mis the perception you had is one that the industry isn't like? I mean, I know every industry has got some way to go from a diversity and inclusion perspective. I think everywhere has, um, you know, it's not perfect. But would you say that actually things are better than you thought it probably would be? Definitely better than I thought. Um, the stats still aren't great, if I'm being honest. But what I can say is I do feel like I work in quite an inclusive environment. We've got, you know, multicultural and ethnicity networks um, where we celebrate lots of different cultures and backgrounds and countries. We do have more, you know, females than I thought that there were. Again, still got some work to do there. What I would say is that it's a lot warmer and a lot nicer environment to work in than I thought. I wouldn't describe it as cutthroat at all. It is worth us, you know, separating investment banking and investment management. So the, the buy side and the sell side, I'm not sure. I've never worked on the sell side in investment banks. So I can't speak for their culture. I do come across them and they seem, seem you know, perfectly nice also. But the industry, to me, it's 
would have been a much, much nicer place to work than I expected. And I was surprised on my internship when it happened, especially when you're not from London, you're not from that sort of world, you're not from that background. It can be very intimidating. You go into the city and everybody's in suits and you've gone to X, Y, Z school. But I actually found that I felt really comfortable there. So I definitely would recommend people, you know, getting out of their comfort zone and considering this industry. So, yeah, better than I thought. Better than you thought. Good. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jim. And Reese, how have you found... Do you find that actually it's probably a, I don't know what obviously your perception of what the industry is going to be like, but how do you find that it's a much warmer than you thought it would be? Less, less, less living up to these stereotypes. Yeah, I mean, I similarly, you know, I've worked at one company, so I guess the only experience I've had is, you know, where I work currently. Um, I don't have much interaction, I guess, with other firms. Um, I, I had similar preconceptions. It's kind of, um, you know, I didn't really think investment was something I would really go and into when I was older because I kind of you know had the same you know it's a bit stuffy and you know dog eat dog and my kind of idea of how I wanted to live my life kind of wasn't really necessarily in line with that and I you know and then I kind of came to applying for jobs spoke to some people at careers days came to the assessment day at Willis Towers Watson and you know the people that presented there was they were talking about how sustainability is such a core thing of what they do and inclusion diversity is such a core thing of you know, talking about their their company's responsibility and also the fact that they advise on all of these assets and we're trying to have influence on all of these, you know, all these asset owners on where they direct their capital, which, you know, is, is a big part of an attraction of kind of working here, which is that, you know, that there's a lot of capital, you know, directing where capital goes is a large part of making, you know, forcing companies to 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 change their practices and policies and not just, you know, release a statement and give some management speak about how they value certain things but don't necessarily um i guess put the money where the mouth is um so i, I yeah I, I think there's definitely been an improvement but there's a you know there's a, a, a really a long way to go to to really get to a place where our industry better reflects you know wider society um and yeah i think i think there's a to be honest I th- but i think there's a, a long way to go for wider society for you know i feel like the things that are tackled first are the the obvious um issues and the things that are someone can easily point and say that's racist or that's not racist whereas it's more the um the softer unconscious type biases or the smaller microaggression type things which just are a lot more difficult to tackle and i think that's you know i think there's a lot of space for an for improvement on that for sure yeah it, I, I think some of these without kind of going down that as a I, I think there's a, a sort of should we say over time as generations come through you will probably see a different uh, a different mindset and a different way of thinking um, which will just take time I think but it and it, it's interesting the point you make about you know it's it's what the clients want as well they young young people now as Gillian was talking about and young people are conscious about who they associate with who they do business with what they want to buy and they make very conscious decisions based on reputation uh, people's actions or companies actions and it's becoming the same with investments now as well as you, you know investors are um, more conscious about where they put their money as you as you were saying Reese, you know clients will tell me and say well I don't want to invest in that that's not something I want to look at. I don't want to invest in an arms company, a tobacco company. I want someone that's environmentally friendly, sociably responsible. Um, those kinds of things. That's become a much bigger issue now, hasn't it, in the industry? Yeah, and it feels like it's moving towards um, not just people talking about it, but also moving more towards action. Um, so, you know, it's definitely going in the right direction, um, which, you know, is a good thing to see. Um, and, yeah, I guess it just takes more and more people to kind of make it clear to the companies they work at that these are things that they value and they're important to them and you know they want to see the company that they work for you know really living the values that they have on the website um yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah it, it, indeed yeah i think as you say it's no longer a kind of tick box exercise so much people actually believe in this now and will take action as a result um we only have actually recently with um the european championships with coca-cola companies putting you know in front <laughs> of players 
and players removing them and saying, well, you shouldn't be drinking this, you should be drinking water and it wiping millions off of the value of these companies. I mean, it's, it's a couple huge. billion, I think. Was it really? It's okay. Cap, so, yeah. Huge, you know, just through one person saying, no, I'm sorry, I, I, w- I don't want that in front of me, I don't want it associated with me. I mean, it's huge, um, huge impact there. So, yeah, it is, it is very important. You're absolutely right. And um, well, we'll come to our next question then. Some really interesting stuff we've spoken about there. But, Gillian, if I come to you, what's day to day like in your life, like in your role? So, on a day to day basis, what kind of things are you doing? What's that like? Yeah, sure. So um, I think it might help a bit if I let you first let you know a bit about what the role is and then we'll talk you through, you know, what I did yesterday, for example. So as an equity research analyst, my role is sort of split into two. I think this might be a little bit unique to my firm, but it, 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 a lot should resonate um, with others. So 20% of my role, I would say, is helping my boss manage the relationships that we have with our research providers. So on the buy side, so as investment managers, we are the ones who invest money on behalf of the clients, but the companies to invest in we need to know a lot about so we did a lot of in-house research but sometimes we go to the investment banks who have some really deep specific knowledge so we have many many relationships with a bunch of investment banks across the world or just general research providers so we've got to make sure that we are we've got good contracts in place that we're paying them a fair amount that the way that we interact is in line with um lifted which is one of the reg- regulations and ways that we're both comfortable with so that's my sort of like process side of things and then 80% of my role is just like the super cool stuff, which is just investing in really forward looking companies. So that's the 80% is really thematic research. So generally when companies invest, they invest based on regions. So you can have like US equities, meaning US companies like Apple, Microsoft, smaller ones. Then you may have Australian equities, UK equities, European equities. However, what we're doing now in my team, the global equities team, is trying to invest based on themes and mega trends that resonate with people as we discussed before so we have a climate and environment fund we may invest based on you know genomics and certain things in healthcare we may look at electric vehicles as a theme so we do thematic research into these big themes and that is my role is to sort of like delve deep and do deep dive reports into those themes and then let the fund managers know okay this is this is the genomics theme i believe that you know, this is the direction that we're going in and these are the companies that can help make this change and stand for benefit. So I guess an average day for me yesterday would be a good one. So I don't have my emails, check to see if there's anything on the research side of things I need to manage. Maybe one of our brokers has called us and said, hey, can we have a meeting to discuss the relationship or you know, payments or something like that? Um, then I would say I probably had, oh, I had my conference. So we met with a really, really interesting guy who was talking about how he sees the world in five, 10 years time. And it's sort of like a thought leader saying, we discussed a lot about CRISPR technology and gene editing. He talked about the population growth in some parts of the world, but how population may half um, by 2100 in other parts of the world. We talked about the future mobility and the you know, flying cars and very, very futuristic. It was really fascinating. Um, so that was really fun. So I just wrote down what I thought that the, the key trends that he was talking about there. Then after that, I would say I'd get down to the research now. So I'm currently researching blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies, new Bitcoin and Ethereum. So I'll have a bunch of reports from a, some consultants, from investment banks, some internal things that we've read. I'll read, read, read a lot. And I'm sort of trying to answer questions like what is blockchain? How is it, you know, how is it changing the world? which companies is impacting positively and negatively, which companies you know, are creating products that can benefit from this theme and stuff like that. Then at the end of the day, I had a pod meeting. So on the exterior side, I'm just collating a lot of information and synthesizing. The, the decision making then goes up to the fund managers and they're the ones who are going to say, do you know what, Julian, you talked about this genomics um, subject, uh, you picked out this company, more deep research will be done into it. There'll be like a 15 page report written and then they decide, OK, are we going to put this, but are we going to buy this stock and then we're going to put it into the fund and say, and if so, OK, we really like this company. We're going to put it in at 2 percent of the fund. So we have one of those meetings and we were talking about entertainment companies and what our thoughts are in the future of the entertainment industry and how much of those do we want in our innovation fund. So that was my day yesterday, if that helps. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, very, very interesting. You get get to meet some um, very, uh, very um, interesting individuals. Um, sound a bit, sound quite eccentric, some of them. Um, 
Absolutely. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. People with these kind of uh, not madcap ideas, but these thoughts about what what's going to happen in the future. So, in 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 summary, really, you are you're the you're really a kind of advisor to the investment management team in a way of right. Well, this is what I found out. This is what we know about what this is, and your job is to kind of help them understand where the opportunities are potentially for on behalf of the clients that you're investing money for. Um, so uh, really, really, really interesting. And it uh, must be very um, must be very rewarding for you in a way of kind of getting all this information. You're, you're, you, you must be exhausted at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, it is very intellectually demanding. But as a curious person, it's just fascinating. Uh, I just spend my days reading cool things about the world. Um, it's worth noting that that's the sort of area of specifically of equities that I'm in. We're very, very forward looking, future looking. There will be other areas where we're looking at you know, good, strong, stable companies that, you know, oil companies that have been around for 100 years or, you know, fast moving consumer goods companies that make the things that you see at the supermarkets, again, stable, strong, have been around for many, many years. So there is also that element of it. But I'm just, I feel quite lucky to be in a position where I'm, I'm trying to manage all of these wacky future thinking ideas of future things like driverless cars or GNS and then helping fund managers get their heads around it and, and tell them, like you said, where the opportunities are. So, yeah, it's, it's very varied. It's, it's intellectually challenging, but that's what I like about it. Yeah, and it, it sounds also that Ben, uh, sorry, Reese mentioned earlier, I don't know why I just called you Ben, Reese. I have no <laughs> idea. Um, <laughs> Reese mentioned earlier about Maybe I like the macro. It, <laughs> no, you, no, I don't know. I don't know. Um, definitely a Reese. Um, <laughs> whatever a Reese looks like. It looks like you, Reese. So um, the, Reese was talking about the kind of macro uh, and then downwards, and it sounds like you do a similar thing. So you're looking at industry or area first. So it would be, as you were saying, um, blockchain or cryptocurrencies. And then you kind of might look at a specific company that you might then invest in as a, uh, as a um, should we say, a feeder from the research that you've done. Um, and then you will look specifically at them. Yes. So in general, as a house, so as a company, uh, we are bottom up investors. So we absolutely look specifically at the stock. So rather than you know larger macro trends, even though we do have an economics team called the Siri, on the equity desks, typically you look at the individual company, then you work your way up and then use risk factors to say whether you, you're going to have too many of one type of company in the model. Um, however, with the thematic research, we are absolutely marrying that sort of like top down thematic look with our bottom up research. And at the end of the day, any before anything goes into the fund, they need to fundamentally like that company in, in its own right. They're not just going to find a genomics or a blockchain one. But yes, we're starting to now marry the two. But as a house, we're still bottom up stock pickers. Great, thank you. Thanks very much for, for that, Julian. A nice amount of detail there. And what about yourself, Reese? So, what's day to day? Um, didn't call you Ben there. My, my, my memory's come back. Um, what, what's day to day like for you? Do you do something similar to Julian or is it something quite different? Um, so, the research part of, my, part of my role, uh, some of the stuff is similar, but we don't, um, or the, the, the vast majority of my role isn't looking at uh, from a bottom up perspective. So, you know, we're advising clients on kind of our overall portfolio strategy um, and we'll essentially, my research is trying to, um, it, I mean, the thematic angle is kind of a part of our research, but it's generally from a macro perspective. Where do we think relative value is based on current valuations of certain sectors, but it's kind of generally at an overall sector or asset class level? Um, you know, what's current valuations? What's current? What's the current macro outlook? What are potential thematic trends like sustainability or, um, you know, the rise of China or what are you know, these large big trends which or demographics which uh, could have, you know, quite material impacts on, you know, a tailwind, which is like a, a structural support uh, for something like over time, trying to overlay all of that together to make a decision as to, you know, where, where we think portfolio positioning should be. Uh, but I wrote my role, to be honest, so I, I've, again, I've got a split role as well, but it's over quite different things so part of its client service so working directly with advisory and delegated clients advisories basically um we will take a proposal to a client and they make the decision of saying yes or no 
whereas delegated um they basically come to us and say this stuff's really complicated we think you're better at making the decisions for us can you make the decisions for us and then we basically have the control over saying what what they should buy and sell over time within a, a whole bunch of guidelines um, and then a small part of my role as well is portfolio management so kind of working within our internal portfolio management team where the relationship between research and the portfolio management team is is quite similar in structure to to Gillian. You know, the research team kind of come up with ideas. The portfolio management team and groups will kind of discuss and debate those ideas and decide whether it's something they want to actually incorporate into portfolios. Um, so to be honest, my days can be very varied, um, which is, you know, a, an interesting part of the role and that there's quite varied things that I, I do. It also can be a challenge sometimes because it's kind of very separated teams. So it's kind of you've got, you know, basically everyone assumes that you're 100 percent in that team. So that they'll, they'll come to you and say, you know, learning over time how to be able to say no to things um, is definitely a challenge. Um, and, you know, especially when you're fairly new, you feel like no is not a word that should be in the dictionary. Um, I, I think I'm quite lucky that the culture at WTW is quite open and you know when people that are more senior give a piece of work generally um they'll they'll kind of ask the question of you know what else have you got on at the minute and and not just trying to lump lump stuff um i guess on you and, and create an endless list of work for you i guess you need a bit of space as well to take on the more interesting project work sometimes as opposed to the day-to-day -day stuff which is really important for understanding getting a good understanding of the detail behind things and how things work but I guess to get an opportunity to really try and figure out what it is that you kind of best at and enjoy um and i think that's an important link i think you know you there's gonna whatever you do there's gonna be parts of the work which are a bit monotonous so you kind of need to have an interest in whatever it is that you're doing to kind of push through those monotonous parts and also to push through the fact that sometimes hours you know aren't uh nine to five um and you know things need to get done in certain time frames and you know to, to keep you need interest there to to you know be able to get that work done i'd say yeah it's interesting that you spoke there about kind of you sometimes you need to have a free mind to work on the project stuff because there's this kind of it's not a, a quick kind of fix right that done finish next thing done finish next thing and actually it sounds like you have to combine the two, which is actually quite a challenge, isn't it? There's a bit that was a big shifting. So research only started a couple of years ago and I've done a few small projects where basically I'd gone to the team and said that this stuff I'm, I find really interesting. Can I, is there anything I can help on? And they'll say, they'll say, yeah, we have about a million more things to do than we have capacity for people to get done. So if you've got some time, we're very happy to give you some work. But I guess actually doing it day to day and getting used to the fact that you know, it's not just work comes in, you do it and move on to the next thing, which is what my other part of my role typically is. It's a lot more, um, you know, things take time, you need to distill a bunch of information, knowing where, although there is a, it's also important to know when to draw a line in the sand and say, okay, now I need to make a decision because um, you can get very bogged down in the detail. Um, and, and there's kind of an endless, I guess every piece of research, there's kind of, you could endlessly I iterate it and feel like you're adding and making it better but there's a certain point where the trade-off is you can need to make a decision and I guess move forward from whatever you're doing um so yeah it definitely is a challenge constant learning curve yeah I, I mean I one of the questions um con uh, coincidentally was what is most challenging about your role and I think you probably you, you may well have just answered that which is this getting that balance right and that ability to then say, right, it, that's enough now. I, I, I'm going to stop there, um, and maybe say, no, I can't do that, or because you've got something else that you're working on, and getting that balance right. Um, would you say that that is the most challenging part of what what you do? Yeah, that and managing the, the work streams and getting used to, um, I guess, making sure that you know you, you, you can do everything you're doing to a good um, a good level. Um, as a person necessarily trying to spread yourself a bit too thin and you know naturally just means you can't spend as much time as you'd like on a certain piece of work but I'd also say you know to the students that are watching that you know talking through what's challenging and the stuff that I do might sound like it's a really complicated thing and it, that's what happened to me when I was younger and I'd listen to people talking about it and presenting I'd be like 
there's no way I'm ever going to be able to do that. Even, even internally, you know, making the move to the research team, I used to hear research people speak and I'd be like, there's no way I'm going to be able to have as much knowledge in my head as these people and be able to do the job effectively. But the reality is that you are constant. Every single person, no matter what age they are, is turning up to work every day and they are learning on the fly and they're learning something new every day. And that's a good, that was like a, a big turning point, I guess, after working, probably happened at some point in the first few months of, you know, trying to, you know, I guess um, it's easy to kind of want to show the impression that you know stuff, especially when you first start somewhere and people sniff that out straight away and all know that you don't actually know very much and people actually are just learning stuff on the fly every day and everyone's doing the same thing. And I guess that's just a important point to take home because, you know, going and starting a job which seems really complicated and seems like you don't know much about it you know no one everyone was in the same position before they started that job um yeah yeah i yeah really interesting what what you're saying there and you're absolutely right it's a matter matter what anyone does actually everyone kind of suffers with the same issues which is how do i manage i've got all of these things to do how do i manage that what do i need to prioritize um all of those things are skills that you learn as you as you become more experienced and yeah there is this temptation isn't there I know when I was you know similarly starting out in my career you want to be perfect straight away and you want to know everything and you feel like why don't I know everything I'm a failure or some you, you, you your mind starts to play tricks that you're not you know I'm not as good as I think I am it's like no no you just have to learn and you'll get there and learning is a is a continual thing it doesn't stop after you leave school it doesn't stop after you leave university you're learning constantly as you say and that's I suppose that in itself that mindset of right don't worry we'll get there um it's just going to take a bit of time and um and all of these people have been in the same position so um yeah not to kind of let that let that uh, trouble you I guess and just kind of using that as an experience and learning from it so Absolutely. Well, thanks for that, Reese. It's uh, really insightful. And, and Gillian, what about yourself? What's the most challenging, before we get on to what you enjoy most about what you do, what's the most challenging <laughs> thing for you? Well, um, Reese has basically answered it for me. Um, <laughs> it's, it's pretty much the same. I mean, it's it's that feeling, at least for me, of, of there's so much constant learning. The, the, the idea that you constantly know nothing is trying to get <laughs> With that feeling that you, you don't know everything and you'll never know anything and in particular with respect to the report there's going to come a time where I need to say to my boss look at this incredibly complicated you know landscape I'm trying to help us really better understand blockchain and cryptocurrencies and distributed, distributed ledger technology which I can hardly even say <laughs> and I need to stand there with conviction and say this is you know where we should be focusing our efforts this is where we can you know, make money for our clients and it's really hard to learn when to stop and say okay you know enough like my last report on genomics is 54 pages like no one needs to read all that <laughs> it was just really hard for me to, this is now where i'm comfortable saying giving my viewer opinion on something so there's definitely that i think getting comfortable with the idea that you will not know everything and secondly having conviction in that decision that you make when you're like okay I think we should buy hold or sell this company or I think this is an area for us and this isn't so that's probably what I find most challenging yeah I mean it's a pull a cliche out of basically what Jillian's just said it's like getting comfortable feeling more comfortable it's like knowing that you know something's in front of you and you, you know you, you can't even imagine how it's all going to come together first of all in six months time that thing you're doing right now is going to be a distant memory and no one's going to care about it anymore so you know boiling it not putting too much pressure on yourself that it has to be this perfect thing um and also you will work it out and it'll be fine and you'll get to the other side of it and there might be some stress along the way especially the first time you do th some a few things but um you know you get there in the end having really? believed you get there in the end Absolutely. Well, it, it, I cast my mind back many, 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 many years when I was learning <laughs> to drive. And you sit in a car for the first time and you're thinking, OK, right, accelerate a brake clutch. Even back when I was learning <laughs> to drive, there was a manual choke on a car. There was no, uh, you know, you had to pull it out to start it. So you, you, you've got all of these things in front of you. Where do I start? And then six months down the line after you've driven, you've, you've stalled the car, 
it only knows how many times you stalled a car. You might have had a near miss. You, you, you know, you, you've cut someone up at a roundabout. You've done all of these things. Then eventually you forget all about that because suddenly you do everything almost subconsciously. You're used to it. You get it. You, you've kind of got into this routine mentally, subconsciously. You know when to change gear. You know the indicators on you're doing all of these things at once and as you say you only get that through actually doing it experiencing it doing it again experiencing it doing it again learning changing it and that's the only way so with anything in life it's the same thing isn't it when you're doing a job when you're doing anything for the first time it's difficult it's a bit of a challenge but you will get much better at it over time as you persevere and you learn from it so yeah, sure. it's, uh, these things are quite worrying at the time, aren't they? When you first encounter them, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm, how's that going to look? And then a week, two weeks, a month, three months down the line, what was I worried about? It's fine. I'm used to it. So it's, yeah, it's um, it's natural, I think, for us, for humans, for us to be uh, to be quite um, anxious and, and worried about some of these things and feel that, oh, we're not as good as, I'm not, I'm not that great, am I, compared to so-and-so? It's like, well, actually, you will be if not better so don't worry about it <laughs> yeah sure. it's a really good it's interesting that you both kind of picked up on that and that's the um the thing and that's useful for that's useful for some of the people that will be um be watching this as well so thank you very much so um ben what do you most enjoy about what you do <laughs> reese <laughs> <laughs> oh can you believe it I'm, I'm 41. you must have been talking to a ben earlier today no, do you know what I was? But I'm 41 going on 81, I think. I think I'm... <laughs> anyway, Reese, I'm so sorry. Sorry, Reese. So what was the, what you, was the best... That what you do? Most enjoy what I do. Um, I guess probably it's the exact flip side of what the mo- biggest challenge is. Like, there's, there's so many different work streams um, that I work on that I guess work stays very fresh because um, I'm kind of doing different things all the time. Although I'd say, to be honest, that if I if the research stuff was 100 percent of my role, I think it'd be the same because it is so like multifaceted and there are so many different things you can do. Um, and it is always changing over time where what you should be focusing on and what the new theme is to spend a bunch of time trying to understand and what it means for, you know, what the implications for an asset class. And, you know, does that mean, it, you know, it improves the outlook for a certain asset class or or, or it does the opposite? Um, so I'd say. The fact that it's quite wide ranging and do different things and, you know, the endless amount of new stuff um, to learn, which, you know, I'd, it's not for everyone. Like I'd, I'd say I'm, I probably only found myself as being intellectually cu- like quite intellectually curious as I've got older. You know, I was never a reader, never read books really as a kid, never really read books until after university, really. Um, you know, it's kind of science at school kind of came a bit more naturally to me. I had a bit of an interest in it. So kind of did that and maths. And then I went to university and I said, OK, I'll do something mathsy that, you know, feels like it's directed towards a career that might help. Um, whereas realistically, if I had to go again and I'm speaking to people, I guess they're just making decisions about university. I'd say, you know, making a decision about what you should study should be based on, you know, what you find most interesting. Um, again, because you need to have interest in something to do work for it, because, you know, seeing the the kind of the criteria for hiring people these days what you've learned while you're a student you know after two months of being a job everyone's going to be on the same level playing field regardless of what you studied going back to what Gillian said before you know historically our industries hired people from the best you know the best universities that studied maths or financial engineering or whatever it was you know those things just are not a core part of the day-to-day job it's far more important to be able to understand, um, I guess, and distill that the qualitative aspect of investment, you know, what's actually happening in the world. Um, you know, every single number you work with is just one way of representing like a thought that you have about how the world actually works. There's no like actual like, gospel truth in any individual number. You know, you're essentially making it up as an assumption. Um, yeah. Went off on a tangent there. <laughs> I like no, not, not not at all, Reese. Um, I've got it right again. So, uh, <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. I think, uh, yeah, I, I think what you said there makes absolute sense um, for sure. And, and Gillian, what what's the what's the most enjoyable thing for you? 
it's sort of like with Reese, it's the flip side of what's most challenging. Um, it is the fact that it's my um, job to find out cool things about the world and tell people about it. It's that I am a very curious person, <clears throat> excuse me, as I said before, and my job is to satisfy my own intellectual curiosity whilst also you know, helping clients make money in the process. So it is just the idea that after this blockchain project, I'll then do the future of food and learn about, you know, plant-based meat and how we're going to get food from A to B, or maybe it'll be about medical technology and how we're going to use more robots to help do surgeries. So I think what I really like about it is the constant learning, even though that's what's challenging because you always feel like you're constantly behind and constantly having to make big decisions. It's also the thing that makes it a lot easier to get up in the morning and, and get to your computer and be like, okay, so what am I going to learn today? So it's not, my job is not very process driven. And I think that suits my sort of personality. And I think it's very different to what I believe, you know, finance and audit, what I believed I should say, finance or audit more specifically within accounting was going to be, it's just like worlds apart from what I thought the role was. And I really do think, um, I want to touch on something that Reese said just then and even it's funny because I'm now working with even though I didn't do history on my graduate scheme we had two historians two one who did Spanish one who did French three engineers and of course we had some accounting finance and economic students but we also had those others it's difficult to say whether or not you know how how easy or difficult it would be to get a job with a specific type of degree I think I'd have to go check in with someone who works in HR but what I can tell you is that I managed to get in fairly straightforward through accountancy and finance because you know that's what the professors were talking about, that's what people were doing around me, that's what the careers fair said. But I look around me and people have studied Spanish. <laughs> so yeah. I think that, that that is a really interesting point that that Reese made and you 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 backed up there, Gillian. And that's something that again I, I can back up with what I know from organizations that I've worked with work for and hear a lot from and a number of those are from the investment management profession when when talking to young people it's do study something that you're really interested in forget if you think that you know i should do economics or accountancy or something like that because i want to get into finance or if you are interested in art study art if you're interested in in a science study science because they don't a lot of firms when they recruit aren't that bothered about what subjects in fact actually a lot of them encourage out of the box thinking they like that they embrace that they don't necessarily want the stereotypical business and finance graduates they 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 like people that think slightly differently or have an alternative way of of looking at things so the feedback i often hear from firms is you know we're, we're not looking necessarily for you all to have a business degree or an economics degree or maths Actually, we're more interested that you've got a decent degree in terms of your grade and that your A-level grades are good. Um, and that also you've done something outside of your studies. You've gone out and you've, I don't know, you've got a job somewhere and you're working and you're you're, you're getting experience um, of life um, or you've done something different, you know, taken a gap year and you've gone and travelled and you've volunteered somewhere or done something else. So, yeah, that the feedback I get certainly backs up what both of you have said and that's just do something that interests you because at the end of the day if it doesn't interest you you won't dedicate yourself to it and secondly the firms aren't looking specifically that you have to have that business economics or maths degree or even a degree in a lot of cases you know a lot of school leaver and apprenticeship opportunities now especially at investment management firms which I see quite a lot of so um I mean, and there are organisations like Investment 2020, which you might be familiar with, that recruit um, school leavers and apprentices and graduates for um, for many. I mean, Aberdeen, I know, for example, I don't know about Willis Towers Watson. They may well do. Um, but, you know, the, the landscape in terms of the pathway and entry routes are changing, as are the those requirements. And when we were talking about the stereotypical you need to go to this university you need to come from this background that there's an example of where that's again eroding away um taking time but it is eventually eroding away so um yeah really good good points for you both to make sorry Jim. no that's okay um yeah i have what you say I, i'll add though that i believe that those who did indeed study engineering or art or, or, or spanish will be asked okay you studied engineering art or spanish why are you sat here in front of us and 
I think I reckon that question will come up, but I believe there could be a good answer to that question. If you're able to demonstrate your passion, maybe, you know what, you've signed up for one of those, you can have like dummy funds and invest like fake money in your spare time or talk about the articles that you read from certain types of publications and why you're passionate about that industry. Um, I imagine that question will be asked and need to be answered well. But like I said, I work amongst engineers, so <laughs> the proof of the pudding. Yeah, and I, I also, you know, there's so much research now that shows how um, diversity is just so important in building effective teams that are dealing with and making complex decisions. You know, we need people that have had different life experiences um, and are from different backgrounds that just approach problems in different ways because there's countless experiences you know in the public sphere of government decision making of you know plenty of blunders in the past of organizations where they haven't been diverse at all and they've been recruiting the same types of people um from the same in, from the same organizations and it's just not the best way of making a group of people that can make good decisions on complex issues um so i think companies are realizing that and that's where you know it feeds into what we were saying before about you know, the, the drive and inclusion diversity isn't necessarily just, you know, people talking about stuff is actually leading into decisions. Now, obviously, you know, as a value from a values perspective, it's important for you know me, for example, that, you know, I want to work in a company that better reflects the society that I live in. But there's also the flip side. It's also good that there's kind of a cherry on top, which is it actually makes better business outcomes as well, um, which you know, for some people is going to also be an important hurdle that um, I guess needs to be met. Well, it, it, it's uh, we sound about diversity and inclusion. It's about diversity of thought, isn't it, as well as everything else. And, and actually that kind of overarches, it's kind of the umbrella that brings it all together is that people from different backgrounds, different gen, you know, different genders, different race, different religions, everything brings a diversity of thought and a diversity of, um, of uh, well, yeah, just diversity of thought really and, and different ways of approaching things. So um, yeah, really important. So yeah, re really good, really good point to make. Um, I'm just conscious of, uh, of, of time here, but um, I was going to ask you both, what, what's your kind of, we, we, we've got two, I'm going to ask two more questions, but what's your greatest achievement to date so Gillian what's what what what's what have you done that's kind of you think yeah I'm I'm most proud of that I'm most proud of doing that um well I guess I'll have a couple but I'll keep it quick if that helps <laughs> <laughs> and the first one is just be being in the job that I'm in now it's like simply finding a job that I enjoy um and is intellectually stimulating and rewarding with people that I like for me that is a huge success um, I think the other one would be launching the podcast initiative that launched last week and being able to try and explain the things that we're discussing now to a lot of younger people to encourage them to, you know, to aim higher and aspire and, and learn from people who have come before them. So probably those two things. I'm going to steal the first one uh, because I think that is one that I hadn't thought of, but I think definitely is something which, you know, it's, it's gratifying to, you know, you, as part of everyone's, um i guess sense of uh value in life like you want to feel like you're adding to the world and i guess part of that is having a job where you get something from it and you feel like you're you get the you know, there's value in what it is that you're doing um and finding a job where that box is ticked i guess it is an is an achievement and isn't you know it actually wasn't a box that was ticked necessarily when i first started my roles changed quite a bit um and i have moved towards areas that i do find more interesting so, you know, the flip side is you might start work somewhere and that box might not be ticked straight away. But um, I guess just keep trying new things and it'll be ticked at some point. Um, other achievements. Um, I've just sat CF, the last level of CFA. Fingers crossed that I've passed it. And that will mean that there is no longer any study for me to do, hopefully um which you know like it's funny because we talk about like in being intellectually curious and, and and enjoy learning new things uh but there's definitely a difference between i guess learning new things that you're picking and choosing to do research on versus learning new things that someone's written in a textbook um which you know it's something that needs to be done um but hopefully it's past it <laughs> i just want to add to your point as your first one which is 
and for me too, I found myself in this specific part of equities. I didn't start and it was all like sunshine and rainbows. It's been a gradual movement over about three years to where I am. So I completely agree with Reese. That box might not be checked initially, but you can work your way there. And good luck with CFA. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. good luck with that. We hope, uh, we hope you pass with flying colours. You say you've done the exam already. Yeah, it was in end of May. Oh, good stuff. When did you get your result? I've blocked it out of my memory. Um, oh, no, okay. I think it's about it's about somewhere at the start of August, I think. Um, oh, okay. So, well, if if yeah, I don't pass, I don't pass. It's not the end of the world, but um, you'll pass. It'd be, don't it'd worry. Be better. Be better. Be better if it if it is a pass. Yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. Yeah, well, we hope um, we hope uh, that's uh, good news um, in August for you, Ruth. And um, finally, the last question I, I wanted to ask was if you've got one bit of advice for someone that's starting out in their career in 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 anything but in, in investment management as well but just one bit of advice one thing that you kind of picked up the thought do you know what yeah everyone should know that Reese, uh, do you want to kick us off with your thoughts on that um yeah i mean obviously sent a few questions i, I have tried to think about this I, I i think first of all i don't think there is any magic one piece of advice which is kind of going to get you somewhere obviously there's different things that are going to be useful um but i would say don't put too much pressure on deciding you know the career path that you're going to go down um you know find something you think you have an interest in you know jillian's breaking through career is definitely something that i would have found useful back when being a student because you, you do put a lot of pressure on that decision making process but just you know find something that ticks a few of the boxes don't need to tick every box and go for it and commit to it um you know it comes through an interview if you've spent time not reading just a website and what the company's values are but you know what it is that the job entails and you know how you how you kind of think you might have some interest in that role so i'd say don't try and find the perfect job find a job which seems good seems like a good fit go and try it and as mean both me and Jillian obviously have done you know iteratively over time You'll make some changes and then you'll find something that you know you actually you know want to do for the rest of your career brilliant thank you yeah really good uh really good piece of advice there Reece. thank you very much what about yourself Gillian? any any pearls of wisdom <laughs> i've got no wisdom i've got some waffle for you i'm not sure if it's any <laughs> it's, it's tough but uh i think mine would be i you know i believe that i believe in luck and I believe I'm a lucky person, but I also believe that you create your own luck. And I believe I create my own luck. Like, you know, many people might think, oh, someone like me shouldn't have got to where I am. But I believe it's because I put myself in the right places to be in a situation where the opportunities came. But it's because I was there, it's because I was ready, it's because I had the mindset of saying yes, taking opportunities. And as Reese said, getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. That's something that was told to me. I don't think I was born that way. But that feeling of almost like, a knees and you have to put yourself out there you have to ask that question you have to go to that event so i definitely believe in creating your own luck and you get that through first comes first you know get yourself a good education focus on you know getting that two one at university and things but a lot of life is about going to careers fairs trying to network going on exchange going to that um in, you know trying that insight week or insight day shadowing someone who seems interesting to you so it's definitely putting yourself in the right places and then i think the opportunities come i just yeah, very quickly yeah. add to something jillian's just said and it, it's it's linked to that point so i i, I agree i think you, that you definitely can create your own look i think also there is so much randomness in life and every decision that you make that you could be the perfect person and done everything that you need to do to get a job on one day but the person interviewing you woke up on the wrong side of the bed or ate something for breakfast or you know someone beat the car at them on the way to the work and they weren't in a good mood or whatever so you know if something if you don't get there the first time you don't get accepted the first time around that by no means is any reflection on that you're not necessarily the right person for it there's so many other factors that are involved um but 100 percent agree with what Jillian said which is you can also do things to try and maximize the chances that the opportunities that you get um you know that they come off yeah to, I, I, both of those you know taking opportunities is, is something i often say when i speak to students you know just any opportunity you've got well go and seek them out but then take them don't just go oh, i don't want to do that 
try it out. You might not like it. Nothing might come of it. But again, don't let that, as you've just said there, Reece, don't let that put you off. You know, if you go to an interview, you don't have a good experience. OK, fine. You've learned from it. Move on. Next one. How's that going to go? Well, hopefully you've picked up some things from that last experience that will help you with that new one. So I think you're absolutely sure. right. Don't don't let it, you know, if, if it doesn't work out, don't get despondent about it. Don't worry about it. You just move on to the next one and you learn from it. And uh, but as you say, you, you've got to put yourself in that position as well, where those opportunities, those doors open up and they do because you are in the right place at the right time. But often that can be very good luck, but often it's something that you've engineered because you put yourself in that position. So it's uh, it's nothing's going to come to you if you're if you're sat at home, not meeting people, not attending things. And so you've got to put yourself out there, haven't you? Um, that's absolutely right. Well, well, Reese, um, Gillian, it's been an absolute pleasure um, to talk to you and it's going to be really useful. Hopefully those people watching it will find it really, really useful indeed. And, and Gillian, we'll thank you so much for those resources. We'll put those up with, um, with this video as well for the careers, the careers, uh, things that you've put together there for us. So really appreciate that. And um, Gillian, Reese, great luck with with the rest of your careers. Um, what what what? Before we go, what what does the future hold for you? Are you? I mean, obviously, Reese, your CFA, <laughs> you're you're pending your CFA result. Um, looking to for some good news on that. Um, what's what's your what do you see as your future pathway? Where do you see yourself going? Um, I guess I don't really know, and I think that's what's I guess exciting about life is that you know you can't really plan more than. A couple of years in a, even probably even less than that in advance if you, if you look back at like what you thought you might do in the next year of you know what i guess one the last year is a specific example where not much has maybe changed in the last year but normally speaking you know you, you'd say i want to do xyz and then a year or two passes and you found yourself in a totally different position um with that being said you know having a plan's good it just doesn't normally necessarily pan out that way um so more exciting opportunities more interesting things to work on um that's hopefully what the future holds thanks Rachel. And what about yourself julian any any anything on the horizon um so i think we've got quite a sort of structured hierarchy it's quite flat at work but it's quite structured so you go from an analyst to a manager to a director to a director to a head of desk um so there's that route which is <laughs> in the sense that I'd love to continue building our thematic capabilities because it's somewhat early days for us but it's something we're taking very seriously and I like to think I'm at, towards the beginning of the sort of wave so I'd like to be at the forefront of building thematic investing at um, Aberdeen or ASI um, and then I'd also love to get more and more people you know, listening to the podcast and making the right uh, careers decisions when it comes to their futures, informed ones, not just based on you know what their parents did or what their school teachers told them but what's in here so both those things, both thematic capabilities and try to help young people um, choose investment management or a career that's right for them. Brilliant. Thanks, Julian. So thank you so much, Ruth. Julian, really appreciate all your time with this and um, good luck in your careers. We've got our fingers crossed for you for August, Reese. Um, and I won't call you Ben again. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thanks again. Thanks so much. And uh, thanks everyone for watching.